Well, good afternoon and aloha, and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. I'm Ron Mizutani, President and CEO of PBS Hawaii, and it is uh, a pleasure to have all of you joining us this uh, this afternoon. Exclusive event featuring a sneak peek of what you just saw, a very powerful film, A Free Cho Su Li. Uh, this episode uh, that you saw today will be aired on Monday, April 24th at 9 p.m. right here on PBS Hawaii, also available on demand at pbshawaii.org. Now, throughout our discussion this afternoon, on your screen, you'll see a QR code. Please consider giving a gift to PBS Hawaii. It is through your donations that we can provide opportunities like this and have these panel discussions and programs like this for you to enjoy. And it's a it's a powerful way to, to share and reach a different audience. And joining me today, and we are just Absolutely uh, humbled by all of their presence today. Uh, and I'll go right down the line. Alan Shen, retired executive director, a coalition for a drug-free Hawaii and member, Chosuli Defense Committee in the San Francisco Bay Area. Alan, thank you for joining us. Ronko Yamada, we saw you on, on the film, Ronko, a community activist, retired attorney, and a participant in the CSL movement and a, and a friend of Chosuli. Uh, long before he was arrested. Ronko, thank you for being with us today. Uh, Eric Yamamoto, retired Fred T. Korematsu Professor of Law and also Social Justice at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Eric, thank you for being with us. And uh, finally, Hoyt Zia. Uh, Hoyt is a retired attorney. He is the founding president and National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. And we are grateful, Hoyt, for your presence as well. And thank you for organizing this distinguished panel this afternoon. Again, thank you very much for doing your, your due diligence and uh, also your network and your reach. Really appreciate it. We thank you for submitting questions, folks. Please do so, and we'll get them to the uh, to the panel as quickly as possible. In the meantime, though, I want to start with you, Ronco. Uh, we saw you in the film, and like I said, uh, you were you were there from the from the start, even long before uh, Cho Lee was arrested. Take us back to that time, and who was he? Uh, what 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 made him this person that people would gravitate to later in life? Uh you know, he was just a, a street person, but a very friendly one. Um, mm -hmm. And you would just see him around in Chinatown and in Japantown in San Francisco. So um, like many, many of my other friends, this is how you befriend people. You just see them around in the neighborhood. Um, he, was, he was just outgoing, social. And both my sister and I um, made friends with him. So this was about a year before he was arrested. And after he was arrested, I wasn't sure that uh, this was, this Chosu Lee person was mm -hmm. the same as Charles Lee, as I had known him. And I called up his probation officer, who I had known from that time, who was coincidentally Japanese American. Bill Nakamura and said, is Chosu Lee and Charles Lee the same? And he said, yes. And that's how I knew about his arrest. You know, before his arrest, or even at the time of his arrest in 1973, the, the Asian American movement was really, it's still in its infancy, if you will, and a diffuse along nation, nationality lines. Alan, take us back to that time. Uh, 73, it seems like eternity ago, really, it's 50 years ago. But at the same time, you look around us today and Boy, some of it is still the same. Maybe take us back to 73. Wow, now you're dating me. So uh, <laughs> I was really young and coming from Hawaii, um, had just moved to the Bay Area, well, actually Sacramento. And my wife went to law school. And then after that, we said, ah, let's, let's go live in San Francisco and then go home in a year. So we said, okay, let's go. So we went and lived in San Francisco and, and stayed there for in Oakland for over 20 years. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it was it was an exciting place. There were a lot of things going on. A lot of um, social service agencies in the in the Asian community were just getting started. Like uh, my former agency, Asian Community Mental Health in Oakland. They, they started around 75, 76. And it was because of the civil rights movement that really got people juiced up and, and they wanted to, you know, do community service and provide services, you know, to the underserved populations. 
which continues today. Hoyt and Eric, same question. Take us back to your memories of, of this time in history. Hoyt, I'll begin with you. And, uh, you know, this is before long before the Cholsu Lee movement and committee started, but your thoughts on in, back in the, in the early 70s? Well, I think you said it exactly right, Ron. I mean, it was a really a period of transition. The Asian American movement, which saw you know, some tremendous changes in how we as Asian Americans, which we weren't called back then, I didn't right. think of ourselves back then, we identified by our you know, ethnic group, whether I'm Chinese, Irish Japanese, Ronald Japanese, you know, Alan is Korean, and you know, we kind of stayed in our own communities. Um, and so there was this period of transition when the the a, a young Asian Americans in colleges and universities began saying and questioning you know, this uh, lack of identity. And that's when Asia, the term Asian American was created and, and, and then took hold. But when Cho Sali was uh, arrested, um, we were still isolated in, you know, in balkanized in our own little communities, which I think partially, partially explains why there wasn't a hue and cry that if it had occurred 10 years later, there may have been. And certainly now with social media, you know, would, would have changed. Back then, we were isolated. We, there was no sense, I think, real sense of community between the different groups yet. Not yet. But Eric, from your lens, from uh, an Asian American, a Japanese American, again, that, uh, the, coming from Hawaii, you know, we, we knew that about segregation. We knew about uh, racism. Uh, was that still alive in the 70s uh, when, when you were doing Law, early in law? The answer is yes, but in a different way. Like yeah. you said, coming from Hawaii, we understand race through a different kind of lens. Mm -hmm. And coming to Berkeley to go to law school, I began to understand for the first time what it meant to be Asian American and face forms of really intense discrimination we hadn't become aware of in Hawaii, even though they existed in all kinds of ways. And so when I graduated from law school, came back to Hawaii, but then I had a chance to work on something that was very parallel to Free Chol Suli which was the Japanese American incarceration cases and the movement for redress. So I came back to the Bay Area right around the time of the Chol Su Lee retrials. And there's some really important parallels there because in both cases, there is systemic racism in the legal system. And both cases really took on not only the underlying specifics of the cases Fred Korematsu, Chol Su Lee, but really to put on trial the whole legal system itself to show how racism can create grave injustice unless it is corrected even after the fact. So Ronco, in the, in the early, uh, when Chosley Cho was first arrested, it took it took a journalist. It took another Korean journalist uh, to uh, KW Lee to create this movement and really grab the attention of everybody else around, including the, the, the uh, legal community, if you will. How did the committee really get started, though? I mean, it it took it was a grassroots effort, like Hoyt said. We didn't have social media, so how did this all get some momentum? You know, um, prior prior to KW Lee starting this, what I would hear from different people when I talked to them about this case, I'd hear people say, "Well, you know, it's just about this one person, and he's not even uh, political." He's not very savvy, just this, just this kid, um, and which was given to me as a reason why people couldn't really get out there and support it. And then there was K.W. Lee, uh, the investigative journalist with the Sacramento Union. And it's almost the same words, but the context is so different. He's saying, it's just this one person. And he's not political. He needs our help. We got to look into this. And that's exactly what he did. He had, it was like um, for KW, um, an epiphany of sorts to look at this Korean man and see um, how an Asian community should come together and really support him. And he did that. He, he wrote these uh, very stirring, um, comprehensive articles. The case was so complex. And he, uh, with a group in Sacramento, Jay Kun Yoon, Grace, and Luke Kim, these were the four members, David Rue in Sacramento, a, an older group. And I say older now, you know, they were maybe in their 
early 40s or something. But um, they took that uh, article and their plea to help Chosu to all these churches and community groups that they knew. That's that was the key. Yeah, in the galvanizing uh, of this yes. effort was was the the Korean churches. Ellen, from what you remember, and and mad respect to KW Lee for for even going there. His his reputation obviously had a lot of credibility. Uh, but at the same time, it was not a very popular story to even pursue. How did that change uh, even for yourself as a young Korean? Yeah, well, you know, coming from Hawaii, I thought I was Japanese growing up because all my friends were Japanese, right? So I'm third generation. Here I go into San Francisco Bay Area and then my eyes just kind of opened up and it's like, oh, wow, there's this huge, there's this, it wasn't a big Korean community, but it was sizable. And, um, you know, they were struggling with, with, you know, probably racism and discrimination. And um, even though my father had grown up there, he had told me stories about, you know, being, growing up in Chinatown, he grew up in Chinatown and he said, you, you had to know how to fight and you had to know how to run because, you know, they're the, all the Chinese uh, kids were after, after he and his brothers. So, uh, you know, so that, that, that's kind of what I went into and it was, um, you know, very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting for some, terrifying, right? Yeah, yeah. I I'm, I'm sure. Uh, you know, I here we are, fifty years later, and and Hoyt, we're seeing some of the same issues when it comes to racism, discrimination, uh, the Asian American community. Uh, you know, watching literally watching their back. I mean, the, the the hate crimes that we've seen, the violence against some of our elder uh, Asian community members, still very real today, is it not? Oh, absolutely. I mean. Uh, Asian women being pushed in front of subway trains and being oh. asked to thrown on them as they're getting the mail at the front, you know, uh, at their stoop. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. I mean, it all goes back to something that I think has been uh, ever since Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos started coming to this country, you know, 150 years ago or so. Um, the same things have existed. That is, we are regarded as foreigners, perpetual foreigners, no matter how many generations, like Alan, three generations. You, know, you look at him or someone would look at him and say, oh, so Alan, where are you from? You know, it's kind of like, okay, and then he'll say Hawaii or he'll say somewhere else. And I'll say, oh, well, actually, if you say Hawaii, people understand. Right. But if you say, like me, I'm from New Jersey, I'd say, no, no, really, where are you from? So that has persisted, even though uh, as a community, you know, we in the 70s during this transition period as a result of the asian american movement we began to see ourselves recognize the fact that you know actually i'm not from china uh, uh, you know al's not from korea eric's not from japan rock is not from japan we are the same because we all look alike according to what everybody else says we get mm -hmm. treated the same and you know what if they're looking for someone to blame someone asian they're going to look at it or this they may say Oh, he's a Chinese person like Cho Su Lee, but he's not. And if that were the criteria, right. he shouldn't even be included in the group. But unfortunately, right. we're all lumped together. And so when anti-Asian violence as a result of, you know, the the calling it the Kung flu or the Chinese virus goes around, every one of us is then subject to attack because people who want to attack us don't care whether where where we our parents or grandparents originally from. They just mm -hmm. care that we all look alike. So, you know, it continues. Uh, we are still regarded as perpetual foreigners, and uh, and and unfortunately, tensions now with China, you know, create a situation where this this all could happen again. Easily, uh, and yeah. Will, will continue. Yeah, and and, and that's a sad tr sad reality and sad truth. I want to acknowledge Pat for her comment. Pat says, "Wow, I'm so glad I did not miss this. So many lessons in this story." Thank you so much for providing this uh, and and providing this panel. Uh, you know, Eric, 10 years after, and I want to get back into Cho Su Lee's case because that's what this film is really about. But 10 years after Cho Su Lee's arrest uh, and wrongful conviction, two other very prominent legal cases uh, galvanized the Asian American community, if you will, uh, the murder of Vincent Chin and also the Korematsu uh, Koram Nobis case. Now, you were part of that in, in the mid-1980s. Take us back there. You, you, it talked about our Japanese Americans incarceration and the U.S. apology and all of that, but this is still. It was ten years later, but it was still very relevant. And in the, in the early 1980s, 
the Japanese American reparations apology movement had stalled. It had grown through ethnic studies in the schools, but it stalled because Congress people said, how can we do anything for redress? Because there's the Korematsu case, but the Supreme Court in 1944 said it was legal. It was the proper right thing to do, to lock up 120,000 innocent Japanese Americans. And so the Korematsu Korum Nobis case, and here I'll be asking a sui Korum Nobis cases, were based on newly discovered World War II government documents, which showed that the government had cooked the books. They had lied about national security, lied about the threats to Japanese Americans. And the US Supreme Court, turning a blind eye, had accepted it hook, line, and sinker, at least the majority. And so I was a part of a legal team that represented Fred Korematsu that sought to reopen his conviction 45 years after he had been, uh, it had been validated by the Supreme Court, kind of extraordinary thing. But it only could happen because there was an Asian American community that got behind this effort. And part of that organizing and help came because there had been Chol Su Lee's organizing and the things that Ron and others had did, done. And partly the legal team of about a dozen people um, that I worked with, and one was Lian Miyasato, Hoitzia's spouse. And we came to see that we had to try this case, not only in the court of law, but in the court of public opinion. Mm -hmm. And what we were really trying to do to get the court of law to undo the wrongful conviction and really essentially clear the names of all Japanese Americans who've been incarcerated. What we needed to do was create in the public mind why there's systemic racism in the legal process that had led to this wrongful convictions in 44 and the taint on all Japanese Americans since then. So we tried the case in that dual fashion. And I think it's exactly um, what the legal teams did in the Chosu Lee case, which is why it was about Chosu Lee, but it was also about racism in the legal system. I'll say more, but I think that's enough for now. No, that, I, that's that's very important. Hoyt, yes, please add to that. Yeah, yeah sorry. No, I was just going to say to you asked about the Vincent Chin case too, and uh, for those uh, of, of the people in you know uh, online who don't know about that case, it occurred in 1982. A young Chinese American uh, draftsman in Detroit was out celebrating with a couple of friends uh, his uh, upcoming wedding. And uh, it was a time when the auto industry, the U.S. auto industry, was in the tank, and we were, uh, and the Japanese auto industry was in ascendancy, um, and uh, therefore a lot of the auto workers who are now out of work and have been laid off were very resentful of uh, Japanese uh, anything that looked like Japanese, because you know Japanese autos, and a couple of guys in a, a white guys in a bar where. Uh, Vincent and his friends were, were you know, celebrating, took exception at his presence and blamed him, you know, Chinese American, for the fact that the auto industry in the U.S. was in the tank. Um, they got into a fight. They were all kicked out of the bar. Vincent started, go, went to go catch a bus home. The two white guys who got thrown out, too, were not happy with uh, what happened. They went to their car, got a baseball bat, and drove around searching for him. And they finally caught up with him and 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 beat him to death, uh, you know, with by you know uh, with the baseball bat. Um, and the net result of it was that uh, they were they were arrested, but at their sentencing, the judge said, you know, these are not the kind of people we should send to jail. These two white guys. So we'll they've already actually they didn't had not served a day in jail. But we'll put them on three, you know, three years probation, give them a fine of a, you know, uh, three thousand bucks each, and we'll call the day. Uh, and that is, you know, even more than the Chosili case, um, because of the different times. Now, several years later, 1982, 83, uh, Chosili was now being freed, and so there was that, as Eric pointed out, going on. Uh, but there were also now networks that had been created among Asians. Plus, I think one difference between how people felt about Chos Lee, I mean, look, you know, first of all, when he was arrested, he was a Korean. So if you're Chinese, you think he's not one of us. Uh, second, he was, a, you know, he was accused and convicted of a murder. And so people don't relate to that either. You know, I mean, right. he created his own problem, right, by being, being a murderer. We believe what we were read in the papers. With uh, Vincent Chin, I think all of us thought, man, this guy could have been any of us. He could have been my brother, my son, my whatever, no matter what, you know, our nationality, original nationality group was. And that galvanized people 
along with having new the networks and social organizations that Alan was talking about starting to be in place. So the word spread. And this really was, I think, the, the event that galvanized and created the Asian American community as we've come to know it. So, you know, I, I want to go back to Cho Lee. You talked about his release. And, and Ronka, maybe you can speak to this. Uh, because his release from prison, although it was a time of of celebration, if you will, maybe not celebration is not the right word, but it was tragic, as almost as tragic as his pre-incarceration. His life after that was still filled with so many challenges and challenges that really took uh, a toll on him physically, emotionally, spiritually, but especially physically. So uh, leading up to his incarceration, he hadn't had a he hadn't had an easy life by any means of you know having grown up uh, until he was 12 in korea that was probably the best family he had being with his auntie and her six or seven children um, they were impoverished they were a very very poor family that would um, have to pick through the dump for, for uh, metal scraps to sell, but they were a loving family, very close. Then he comes to San Francisco and life goes downhill from there. There is no support. Um, he goes to school and he gets a, uh, he doesn't speak English and for that crime, it's considered a crime that he, he can't speak English. They think um, he needs to be in a psych ward and then they give him uh, psychotropic medications. So, so he doesn't have a very um, good experience in school and he's not uh, well educated. Then he goes into prison his entire adult life, 19 to uh, 30 years old is prison. So, gee, what do you expect when you mm -hmm. get released from prison? How well are you going to adjust when there really aren't any services available at that time that could, that could take you on or that we even knew about? I think because, um, because of who Chosuli was and who we were, we didn't know of those kinds of services. If we had been wealthy, Mm -hmm. they would have been available. Thank you for that for that background. Very important part of a story that uh, we we just watch about this this person who, you know, he ha he had it tough. I mean, we, not to make excuses for any of the, the things that maybe he did mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, but once once he became the target of this investigation, it was uh, it, he he didn't have a chance. Uh, and and I know Ronco, you shared a very confidential recommendation letter. Uh, I hope you don't mind me talking about this. Um, the, the Chosu court files, it really had obstacles, uh, invisible obstacles that really nobody knew about. There was a lot of mistruths and misinformation being shared, was it not? That letter, I, I wish I had it in front of me, but um, a confidential letter given, passed on to the prison from his first uh, conviction, that first murder conviction in Sacramento, and it was unsigned. So it was either from uh, Frank Falzone or the sitting judge. And it's it's a full page letter that just says, this man is a killer. Um, he, he was a Chinatown gang member. You know, he, if, if he should ever be released, make sure you deport him. Uh, you know, he's an undesirable alien. <laughs> and the fact of that, see, nobody gets to see that. We got it in, in Discovery wow. when we were getting uh, all these files to uh, prepare for another hearing. And suddenly that document was in there. It can never be challenged because it's just in the secret files. And it's untrue. It was all false. And you don't even know that 
there's these documents. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it's more than that for me. I, I, I shared with all of you earlier when we were offline, it, this, this story angers me deeply. Uh, I, I understand about racism. I experienced myself as a journalist, even here in Hawaii, which is sad to say. My son is a journalist in Minneapolis. He's an Asian Japanese Hawaiian boy covering hockey. He gets it left and right. Go back to Hawaii. You don't know anything about hockey. Go grab your surfboard. I mean, all the things, not to mention the fact that, uh, you know, he he's exposed to some of the, the hate crimes in Minneapolis. But when you hear about these stories, Eric, of invisible truth, uh, well, just the fact that we didn't, this young man didn't have a chance, yet there are other cases that are probably very similar, other uh, Asian Americans who have to endure some of this wrongful accusations as well, they didn't have a chance. And I think that's a really insightful linkage, Ron. And, and thank you, uh, Blanco, for sharing that. that. That horrific letter, full of lies, is significant because it reflects a kind of viewpoint that creates a stigma for someone who has been in prison, mm -hmm. been in prison for a highly publicized crime. And so it brings out all the worst kind of setting for Cho so Lee. It kind of it slammed the door in his face before he could even walk through it. And the parallel is very significant in so many ways, but especially I take, let's take Fred Korematsu, who had challenged a Japanese American incarceration in 1942 and had lost. He took it all the way to the Supreme Court and he lost. He did it because he said, this shouldn't happen. I'm an American. We have the Constitution. It shouldn't happen. I didn't do anything wrong. We did anything wrong. It shouldn't happen to us simply because of our race. But the fact that he went, he challenged it. The government lied and lied to the courts and lied all the way through to justify the mass incarceration. Once he was incarcerated, that he got in term ended, he was out. He carried the weight sure. of that disloyalty of all Japanese Americans on his shoulders. So for 40 some odd years, I take that back, for for many, many decades, he could not even talk about it to anyone, not even his children. And so Karen Korematsu is now carrying on his legacy, uh, tells a story about she was in high school in the Bay Area and she came home from work uh, school and said, mom, you know, we read about in the civics class so this Korematsu guy who challenged the Japanese American incarceration and lost. Oh, you know, uh, are we are we related to him in any way? <laughs> wow. And my mom said, wait till your dad comes home from work and talk to him. He had never uttered a word to anyone because deep in his gut, it created this huge psychological dissonance. We're innocent. I'm American. I believe in mm -hmm. equality and justice. Wow. And yet we and I are being persecuted. And he could not carry that weight, ulcers, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll, I'll close by saying, but what became really important to Fred is what Ronco and you and many of the others did, which is you fought to clear his name and also to put on trial the whole system of injustice that, that really uh, visited the injustice. And that's what gave him his voice back. So an unjust racist legal system can take away your voice, take away your dignity, but a community and critical lawyers, lawyers play a key part of that, and journalists play a key part of that. Mm -hmm. They band together to help the person regain the voice. Yeah, very well said, Eric. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Sometimes we make fun of our attorney friends. Sometimes we make fun of our our, our journalists and uh, friends. But you know, in this case, collaboration it can save the day and at least open the conversation. I have a comment here from Christina, who, who writes, in my American history classes, only one case was identified with Asian American activism. I believe it was about the Chinese American Hoyt that you spoke of killed in the baseball bat in Detroit. Why isn't that case more commonly discussed? Or we talked about it just now, but why, why are we not hearing more about these cases and teaching our children, our grandchildren about the history of the struggles that are very real today? Well, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of reasons. One of it, I think, I think within our own families and communities, we talk about it. Uh, and uh, uh, but I think the larger problem, and I think uh, Professor Eric could probably talk a lot more about this because this is exactly the seal something called critical race theory, uh, mm -hmm. the sense that uh, the majority uh, 
of society here doesn't need to know about this stuff. Slavery, uh, you know, incarceration, killings of minorities, uh, the disappearance of, uh, of uh, indigenous women and people, because it doesn't impact their lives, right? Sure. So anyway, the, and as I think everybody here knows, and probably most people in the audience have heard, critical race theory. What is that about? Well, you know, and basically it's about teaching what mm -hmm. else happened in this country. But then I guess the concern is that it makes white people feel bad about themselves or something. Um, but, uh, you know, again, uh, Eric is the expert on that. He may have a few things to say about critical race theory. Eric, please, by all means. Sure. And I think Hoyt's right that one of the key, and Ron, this is what you were, how you started it off with the question, why don't we know more about these things? Mm -hmm. And so many of these things are so significant and a part of our history. So part of the movement that really started with the civil rights movement and black Americans really deserve so much of the credit for the blood and energy and sweat in the streets. Uh, but then the Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, that became a part of it. Uh, communities of color, gays and lesbians, transgenders, uh, immigrants, people who were struggling against systemic forms of injustice. You know, that realized that the way the system was set up, you know, there's a lot of great things about it, a lot of terrific things about American institutions, but the institutions themselves were built with headwinds for people who come from vulnerable difference, uh, communities of difference. And so the history that got told tended to exclude. And so part of the movement, really since the civil rights movement in the 60s was to tell full histories, as Hoyt said, that there are many perspectives on the history. So part of that included the Vincent Chin story for Asian Americans, Part of it certainly included the Japanese American incarceration, the Dr. Wen Ho Lee story, which I can tell you about more later, which is very almost identical here. But there are many other such stories for Native Americans, certainly Native Hawaiians. And now stories about Micronesians in the Filipino right. community in Hawaii. Right? There's it's only a, a partial history, a partial current day story that gets told. So part of the movement really is to tell the full story. Part of the pushback is to prevent that telling. Because part of the telling comes anger when people realize what actually happened and how it had been suppressed. The Japanese American incarceration lies told by the government were suppressed for years and years and years, deliberately so. And so there's pushback. But part of the push forward is let's get forms of reparative justice. How do we not only acknowledge what happened, how do we repair the continuing harm? And so these are the pieces that all kind of fit together that create a very powerful dynamic in the present day. And I'll stop here for now, but there, there's many, much more to talk about. In this. But let's let's. Uh, I have a couple of questions I want to get to. Um, what's different about this case uh, that is not commonly known gets back to the question: What galvanizes communities? This is a lot of race-driven conversation, and rightfully so. This is what uh, Charles Lee, uh, Lee endured and experienced. But what about issues of class and conduct? Because this goes beyond race. As we know, with with our transgender community and and our you know gay lesbian community, and, and now as we see here in Hawaii, Micronesian community. Alan, I see you shaking your head. I know that this is something that that you see and seen and continue to see. That's true. I mean, you know, it's injustice again um, on a very broad level, uh, especially for the Micronesian community, which is mm -hmm. the newest immigrant community in Hawaii and many other states on the mainland. Um, you know, they really are, you know, longstanding mistrust and understanding between Micronesians and um, the local Hawaiian community. And, um, you know, they're often called welfare cheats. Um, they're, you know, they don't want to work. They're lazy. They just come to the U.S. to have babies. And they, you know, um, they, they're welfare cheats. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they have this bad name already. And then something happens and I... Um, you know, like the uh, the killing of uh, Skycap, which is a 16-year-old Micronesian. Actually, he's a Chukese youth, uh, where he was. He and his friends were on a crime spree, and were being chased by the cops here in Hawaii. And uh, he was shot ten times in the back and the head. And while the police were absolved of any wrongdoing, um, the, the Micronesian community, Micronesian community, you know, really reacted um, to this 
injustice. They felt like, you know, this was just a setup, you know, and no matter what the facts were, he was not treated well, and it was an unjustified homicide. So, you know, there's that that whole underlying kind of boiling, you know, boiling point kind of hostility and anger that uh, comes from both sides, I think. Sure. But it, it galvanized the, the Micronesian community. Uh, yes, I think yeah. they, they did. Yeah. They did protests and, you know, they're set up like the Korean community. They're very church based. Um, they have a chief system. And so for them to organize, um, it's not it's not difficult. But, you know, I think they needed the the political will. And I think they, you know, they, they got that with this case, uh, even though it didn't really, um, you know, really, I think, bring any justice to them. Um, it does set them up in the future. I think they, yeah. if there was a case that it would ever come up that was more, you know, appropriate for protest and and you know trying to resolve you know issues, um, they could do it. Definitely, yeah, it, did, it did not bring back a life, but it did create an opportunity for a community to come together and have a voice. And right. I think that's that that was the outcome of that. Eric, did you want to say something? Yeah, I'd like to to jump in on that if you don't mind. And I'm sorry for maybe speaking a little longer. Than no, I not think. at all. Um, but but it's, I want to build on Alan's point, which is really insightful. And I'll say that actually how the Micronesian community came together in the Skycap case was really an outgrowth of something earlier. The Micronesian community really coming together for the first time to challenge in court um, <clears throat> the cutting off of their health care benefits from the state. And people don't realize that there's a real backstory to why the wrongness of characterizing Micronesians in a way as welfare cheats or here is immigrants just trying to get a free ride. What people don't grasp with the story that isn't told is that the reason they are allowed to come here is there's a compact of free association with the states in the Micronesia area with the United States. And what happened was the US became trustee after the World War II, but after the nuclear testing and, and devastated all the islands in healthcare in the area. And the US said, we will become trustee and we'll provide healthcare, education, all mm -hmm. these things for you folks if you give us access to military bases, essentially, right? That's what's really on the radar screen today. Right. But then we, and this is where, again, lawyers and journalists working together, we came across the documents that showed that the government decided, you know what, let's purposely fail as trustee. Let's not give them the health care that they really need. Let's make an educational system. Let's actually keep them dependent on us, the United States, so that they will keep giving us military access. And part of that means then where are they going to go for health care and school? So that's where they get free access to the United States. And it was a good pro quo for the U.S. access to military bases. So that's why Micronesians would come to the United States for health care and then stay and work. So that's why they weren't here as freeloaders. They weren't here as welfare cheats. They were here. And, and then the federal government cut off access to medical care funding. And then the state stepped in and then the state stepped up. So it was the legal challenge that helped bring the Micronesian community together in part to tell the story about why they are there and what they are, why how they should really be characterized. So, I think these two things have set up maybe the very next case that comes forward. It, it, I think this. I mean, not think this. Granted, this is the Micronesian community. What happened with the Chosili and the Korean uh, Chinese community in the Bay Area? I mean, we can go in Detroit. What happened there? They they all kind of have uh, the similar theme, if you will. Um, and and then yet here we are in Hawaii, so far removed, but really not. I mean, here on our panel alone, we got so much representation of Hawaii. Going back to the Chosili movement and the committee, Ronko, maybe you can help me on this. How was Hawaii involved in this at all? I mean, I I understand there were some rallies uh, at the time, but was Hawaii's legal community involved? Anybody of impact? Legal community, I I don't know. I don't know. There was such broad support uh, from the Asian community overall. I, I, I wasn't aware of uh, any particular legal kind of. Uh, Did we provide a voice? We, as in the this 
the state of Hawaii? Alan, what do you think? I, I think I, people I think in they Hawaii. Did. They did through the churches. Churches. Yeah, definitely. They're supportive. Definitely supportive. Raised money, had rallies, you know, hosted uh, JU when he came to Hawaii. And um, yeah, um, they were very involved. I mean, they understood what was going on. There was no mm -hmm. question about, you know, they might have been 3,000 miles from Chosu, but they were with him all the way. I, I ask all of you the same question right now, if you can just spend a little time saying this, because this is why we're here. How did this movement change your life? Oit? Did it inspire you to chase law, to, to chase justice? Or I don't want to put words in your mouth, but how did your involvement or your view on this case change your life? Um, you know, the Chosa Lee case did not so much because... Um, um, I was a young lawyer in the Bay Area when he was being uh, having his retrials, and uh, and and like I said, it wasn't that well publicized actually, except within certain pockets of the community, and particularly within the Korean community. What did come up was uh, the Vincent Chin case right around the same time. My sister Helen was uh, a leading advocate for that. She's living in Detroit, so she was was part of the movement to get justice for Vincent Chin. And she's the one who made a lot of calls to people she knew in, in the Bay Area, which then uh, created a, a committee to get to, uh, to uh, obtain justice for Vincent Chin. And throughout the country, the same thing happened. But in answer to your question, I think that, um, you know, like Ronco, I, it, it, it's, it's you know kind of a personal thing. When you grow up, when the time that I think most of us did, and particularly like me in New Jersey, there was very little of an Asian community and Asian awareness. Uh, and you are caught between sort of two cultures. My parents were both from China, refugees from China. And, you know, we were never sure as kids growing up whether we were Chinese or American, you know, and, uh, you know, so because of so many of the, our American <laughs> Tony Americans would tell us to go back to our own country all the time. Sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, my parents, you know, they didn't know any better about uh, uh, how things should be and how we should be. So learning about my identity as an Asian American is what brought me into to back into California to be part of the Asian American movement, the Asian American community. And that just led into wanting to do justice and uh, as a lawyer to serve the Asian American community, which is at the, the heart of, of everything um, that, that we were doing at that time. Bronco, how did this movement change your life? You know, I, I came from um, Stockton, California, and I had been uh, a part of a group that was called the Yellow Seed, which was, you know, Pan-Asian, mainly uh, Chinese, but um, it was Pan-Asian. Yellow Seed was more of a service group. It was a, a self-created uh, group of uh, youth that was taking um, taking a lesser of I don't, I'm not sure how to say this, but uh, it wasn't a civil rights organization. If anything, it would have patterned itself with uh, Black Panthers, like serve the people, like uh, serving community needs. And this is what the Yellow Seed was about. So I had that kind of identity leaving Stockton and going to college. Um, and I had also known in my lifetime um, many people, many young Asians, who had been arrested and gone to jail or gone to prison. So uh, uh, Chosu Lee was uh, that kind of that tipping point where you think, where are these lawyers that should be serving their community, serving people? And that's uh, the reason I went to law school. And when we were law students, <laughs> uh, a number of us organized and and started an organization. At the time, it was called Nihon Machi Legal Outreach in Japantown. And it served uh, the Japanese community, those who had language difficulties, who, um, who needed uh, different kinds of services, um, 
who were generally the most uh, vulnerable, you know, within mm -hmm. Japantown. Now that organization still exists today. We started that as law students. Now it's called Asian Pacific Islander Legal Outreach. And it has uh, just this incredible reputation working with um, um, women. Many, uh, many of the issues surrounding women, whether it be abuse or, or smuggling um, of immigrant women, and it's, this is the kind of organization uh, right. that I meant, like right? one that serves the community. Yeah, there's a, a heavy dose of human trafficking involved in, in that kind of discussion as well. Ellen and Eric, same question. Uh, this movement changed lives. How did it change yours? Ellen, I'll start with you. Well, I mean, it was eye-opening. I mean, it was an extraordinary case to begin with. I couldn't believe that somebody would be trapped in this this, you know, this horrible problem. But um, so, so what, what he showed me, I didn't, I, I don't think I knew him that well, but you know, you would write to him and he'd write back to you. And the way this guy could keep his humanity, that that's what really impressed me. This guy's on death row and he's writing me back and saying, how are you doing? You know, and <laughs> uh, you know, what are you doing today? Uh, that kind of thing. And um you know, that's what really impressed me about Chosu, that he had this resilience mm -hmm. that, um, I don't know, he, he got it from somewhere. He had good he had good Korean genes in him or something. <laughs> he was a fighter. You know, we know right. that. He was a fighter. He wasn't going to give up. And I think, I, you know, I hope, you know, I wish that he could have had a happier ending and a better life at the end after he was released and could have, you know, found some peace. But I think, you know, that was Chosu. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know how he did it. And I remember, you know, going, um, some of us went to visit him on death row at, in San Quentin and just going to the visitor center, you know, that big steel door behind you goes clunk. And it's like, wow, you know, this is scary. This is really scary stuff. How can, how can he exist in this environment? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But and here's he Chosu, yeah. you know, asking like, oh, did you bring me kimchi today? You know, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. He wasn't a he wasn't a big guy. What, five no, feet two, five no. foot three. Yeah. Just yeah. but but knew how to survive and they talk about resilience. Yeah. Thank you for that because it, there's a lot of I don't want to say negative, but there's a lot of uh, sadness to this story, no doubt about it. Um but there is some hope, there is some inspiration, there's some positive uh messages I think that we all can come out of this. Eric, your thoughts on this case, how it changed your life and and um you know the, the fight that you continue to stay as you continue to teach law to, to young young adults? Uh, you know, the, the milieu of the Asian American struggle for justice was pretty new in the late 1970s, early 80s. I think really Ronco and, and your people really were pioneers in very important ways. And so I actually uh, had come back from law school, back to Hawaii, I was working at a law firm and was about to be offered a partnership at a big law firm. And I decided to turn it down because I knew there was something more for me at that very same, I knew there was something about the struggle for justice that was still to be in my future. The very week I, I declined to go forward with a partnership, I got a call from the Coram Novus legal team in the Bay Area, come help us. And so I did, I picked up and left and moved to San Francisco. And uh, from there, I began to work on the Koromatsu Coram Novus case and all of the things that that did, the retrials, the retelling of history, the setting the foundation for the apology and reparations and all the things that, that came from that. But from all of that and how it really changed the trajectory of my life is I really drew kind of two uh, two insights, if I can share those. One is, is dark and one is bright. And the dark one is a bit of underlying anger. And I know, Ron, you mentioned how viewing this can touch this Chosili story, it really kind of hits an anger button in you and for all of us. And the, and the dark part of it is to realize in Hoyt's language, this could happen again. Right? And the lesson is during times of distress, during times of fear for help or crime of the economy, stereotypes resurrect their ugly heads going all the way back to history. And the scapegoating becomes very easy to make middle of brown people feel better by pointing the negative finger, the damning finger at other people. And then having policymakers follow up and take it out on those scapegoated people. 
And we see it right this very day, but it happens over and over. And that's a very dark, negative story. What that means is injustice is always right around the corner because that exists in the legal system too. So we must always be vigilant. We must always not have Pollyanna eyes, but always have really critical, vigilant eyes to, to see it when it happens. But for me, the, the brighter part of the story, and it's a hopeful part of the story. And again, this comes out from the free choice relief struggle. And again, Rocco, I keep mentioning you because I'm truly inspired. I didn't know you from before, but from watching this and other videos and, and hearing you, uh, and I know we have another story I hope you can share with us. Uh, I really am inspired by you. What I realize is that, you know, there are openings to correct injustice. Mm -hmm. And that is the confluence of organizing the community advocates. It's the, the young, passionate lawyers. It's the journalists, right? It's the onboard policymakers. And it's all of that combined to alter the public consciousness to say, here's the injustice and why there's systemic racism or homophobia or what immigrant bias whatever it is, and how it infected the process to generate injustice. And here is a path towards justice. We can do retrials, we can go through policy. We can do these other kinds of avenues to correct the injustice. And that's a very hopeful path. And I think that's what comes out of all of this struggle for me too. Eric, thank you. Uh, Ronko, I wanna, you know, we have to wrap things up. It's been a very fast hour. Um, you have a story to share with me. I, I really would like to hear it. Do you, can you share? Uh, we talked a little bit about if we had time. Do we have time? Oh, I was going to share a story of some of, uh, of incidences that didn't make it into the film. Yeah. That? Yeah. Uh, We're all I, curious. Yeah. Okay, here, here's one. Jury misconduct we're in the retrial of the Chinatown case. We're about two thirds of the way through. And we bring, you know, supporters every day to this, the trial. And one day, um, somebody passes a note over to us saying, um, you have a rigged juror on your panel. Wow. We're we're already two thirds done with the trial. And uh, Stuart Hamlin, uh, Tony Sarah, myself and Tink Thompson took all the, the, 12, the 12 and the alternate jurors, all the information, the documents leading up to how they were selected, went back and opened that up and we studied every single juror. What could who could this be? It was from a credible source. And the source had said they had gone to a party. They were at a party and there was this group of, uh, of DAs and cops laughing in a corner saying they have this trial. They got it down. They had someone on the jury. Wow. We looked at every single person and there was nobody there that looked. And then we just had to narrow it down, narrow it down. And there was a woman that said she was single. And we just had to guess and say, it has to be this woman. And we went to the judge and he says, okay, first call that guy who told you you know, what he had heard, haul him in, and I want him to say it under oath. So this poor guy who was doing us a favor had to come in and, you know, under oath, give his story <clears throat> about having heard this at a party. And then, uh, you know, we, we named the person, Josie Mathis, and said uh, the judge had her... Uh, go into his chambers and he, and he asked her further questions. And it turns out um, she was married to a cop. She was friends with the DA. Wow. She would have hung the jury and maybe even, um, you know, been able to persuade other people. And the judge sat on that. 
he sat on that. We didn't know what he just said. I'm going to take all this information under submission. He didn't do anything. And right before we went into deliberations, he said, Josie, you are excused. Wow. And our last alternate came onto the panel. Oh, wow. oh my gosh. That's an amazing story. Wow. <clears throat> we would never have known that if we had not done our outreach and really yeah. reached out to different people wow. so that they felt that they could come and say, tell us. Wow. Ronco, that is uh, a nugget. <laughs> it's like, I, I want to end with that because I think that says a lot about, uh, the that epitomizes community uh, network and, um, you know, in some ways, trust, not trust, a lot of ways, trust and empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, for for some reason, this this nugget of information came your way and who knows it but probably would have changed the outcome of, of the trial yeah. and history yeah. as we know it yeah. history as we know it thank you for sharing that ronco well i got goosebumps <laughs> makes me want to do a couple of rounds well you know what I, I have to wrap this up uh what a, i could go on and on with this eric hoyt alan ronco thank you so much for being with us uh and thanks to everyone who's out there listening i, ho I hope you got a lot of information out of this, we knew it'd be a dynamic conversation. We knew there'd be uh, a lot of lessons learned, and in, in some cases, hope providing hope, like that Eric that you spoke of, is uh, is what we got to do, and we got to keep that. We got to keep together and 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 fight this fight. And I don't mean going out and physically fight, although it makes me want to do that when I was watching this film, and I watched it three times now. But this does conclude our panel discussion. Uh, we thank you again for spending the afternoon with us out there. Uh, PBS Invite, you will be sending you an audience a survey through email for your feedback on today's event. Please do take some time to, to fill that out and improve on our screenings and what we do. Also, that screen, uh, on the QR code on your screen, please consider a gift to PBS Hawaii. Again, we don't, uh, we don't do what we do without your support. And we do appreciate everything that you, uh, you do sent our way. And don't forget, if you missed this or your friends missed it, remind them about the broadcast premiere. That'll be, uh, you got a sneak peek, if you will, the Free Chosu Li airs Monday, April 24th at 9 p.m. right here on PBS Hawaii and also available on demand at pbshawaii.org. Also, you're going to find a recording of this panel discussion. Folks, we're going to put it on our YouTube channel in a few days. So if you missed our conversation, you can watch it again, share it with your classes, share it with your friends, uh, because this is a story that needs to be told over and over and over again. Folks, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Very much so. On behalf of myself, our panelists, Thank all of you. us here at PBS Hawaii, mahalo nui. Until next time.